now conduct a design scenario. During this session, we'll present you with a design request and a set of requirements. Using the whiteboard, you should walk through your design and thought process based on the information provided. You will have 30 minutes starting after I complete the reading of the scenario. So in the uh, design, you actually show a 10 gig network and an 8 gig fiber channel uh, storage uh, network. And I'm curious, were these done separately or was there consideration for doing a converged storage network where you actually split it out? What are your thoughts on that? What is the uh, capacity planner tool? I don't know what that is. So this is a tool that um, was used by one of these managed service organizations to really evaluate what we had, the hardware, and they've got some ratios of what, how many physical servers could be placed on a virtual environment based on some theoretical, uh, we call them phantom servers. Okay. Did you know how many phantom servers were there in the environment? Uh, I don't have the specific details. That's something we can get on a follow-on meeting. What's the uh, 15 to 1 ratio based on? I mean, what's, what's it, is, it, is it all CPU? Is it just memory? Is it a combination? It's a combination of, of memory, CPU, storage, based on the uh, phantom servers that we've got configured. And as I said, we can get that information on a follow-on meeting. All right. Um, on, the, uh, on the storage devices, you have a uh, fiber channel is a constraint. Um, is this the only solution available? Why is that the reason that it's a constraint? That it's right not? now, that's the only hardware we have uh, on premise, but we're looking for your expertise to give us recommendations. Is it's there, a constraint because that's what we are currently using. Is there any budgetary constraints other than the fact that it's what you have available? Uh, right now, we're doing the explore, exploration of what the actual costs are going to be. So we have some, some budget, but we're looking to get a couple of options so we can go back to our management team to get support for that. So I can make some recommendations based on the, requ on the performance requirements and capacity requirements that you would have for this? That design. is correct, yeah. Okay. Um, in the side of the, uh, the array level configuration, uh, what are the requirements for the workloads that are going to be running on the infrastructure? Is it just, do you guys have designed one specific rate type based on I'm going to use, it's going to be used for everything, or is, are we exploring different rate? We're exploring different areas. Okay. Since you know more around the virtualization right. side, we're going to look for your expertise on, on what the best setup for the, uh, the back-end storage is. So I, I wrote up RAID because obviously depending on what we get into the uh, workload sizing and workload performance requirements, we may have to explore different rate uh, sizes where one we want to cover and enable things like uh, faster read, faster write, sequential read, sequential writes, where yep. you know, the, the type of applications that you would run in these virtual machines would have to reside on these type of RAID uh, configurations so that they have the performance that's required. So, so we have some information on the, on the second um, slide. And okay. We can go that in just a second. So for the different types, we've got a breakdown on the second slide on um, about 90 of the servers are what we call read write balanced. Um, 65 of the servers are read intensive and 45 are write intensive. Okay, so obviously in the different scenarios where you have write intensive sort of applications, whether you want to, one, consider the fact that if you go into a, a, a rate set can have an effect on the capacity available, but also it can spread the write in the AOS through multiple disks, which can obviously speed up the, the transaction for those types of uh, uh, virtual machines. So that's something we can consider in that case in Explorer, but also you, wanna, you may want to uh, think about what's, what's more important in this scenario, whether we're we looking for IOPS availability or capacity. Right? Yep. So based on the information that I'm able to get from you, I'll be able to make a decision which would best suit the solution we're looking for. Either we come in the middle or we go either way on the other one. Right? But the solution has to be based on one of the, one of the other two, and we have to explore what that is. But, you know, either, but I can tell you right now that maybe a RAID 10 configuration for some of the reads from the right system, but you know, RAID 5, which we normally talk about having you know, redundancy, but it might be too heavy on the right, right? so that, ha that can have an impact on the performance on your applications, depending on what it is. Rollinson, uh, what do you have to consider for running your VMs in a pr production and a non-production environment? Well, in this particular design, um, being the fact that the storage error was a constraint to the customer, um, and in a lot of cases, what happens to their non-production environment was basically a test bed, a test environments for their uh, tier one type of application, so they needed it and they needed to perform as much as the the, the production environment. They were going to re they, were, they were going to reside in the same uh, hardware infrastructure because we couldn't uh, kind of separate them in terms of having the, the ability to have a, pro a prod environment and a non prod environment. Um, in a different scenario, if we were capable of having per se our choice and introduce a different solution, the recommendation here would be to have your your production 
uh, inf environment, your production applications that reside in a, in, a, in a separate array, if possible, where the performance, the availability, the recoverability requirements are met and guaranteed, where if there's a failure, not only do you cover and reduce the fault domain where your production and non-production fail at the same time because they depend on the non-production environment as well, the ideal will be to have possibly have a, a separate, not as expensive, not, you know, not a super high-end sort of a storage infrastructure, but in this case, the, the, they have a pretty uh, unique scenario where they, they rely on both in the qualification between product and non-product, basically who's using it and who's not. But they have to be able to produce the same kind of performance. What were your design considerations for, for the growth of the 192 physical machines um, that were to be virtualized in the phase two? Well, in order to accommodate to that forthcoming capacity, uh, based on the design of the clusters and the amount of compute resources they had, once I calculated the total required capacity to sustain what's available, I saw there was enough capacity for future growth with substantial capacity. Um, going through the process of allocating, being able to allocate 100% in a worst case scenario to every one of these workloads that were going to reside in these clusters, the capacity provided by the cluster surpassed what was required, therefore had enough to meet the same type of workloads over 194 times. So that's sort of like the process that I took. It was a calculated process based on the compute requirements and resources that were available and required. So I have a question on the use of a 10G network for the standard IP and the 8 gig fiber channel storage, was there a consideration on looking at a converged network to combine the two together with the, with the gear that you had available? Currently, the customer was not looking into using a converged solution. Even though the capabilities are there, the reason why we went with this design is because we, one, we're, we're upgrading that existing infrastructure, which we still, which we still have to use. Um, and the, and the, the networks are still isolated in that way, where the IP network is 10, but the fiber channel network is, is, is at the, the speed that it's currently running at, um, there is flexibility to possibly move to a separate solution if, uh, at a later point in time where that might be, for example, considered to bring in and convert and use some sort of thing like maybe FCOE uh, and be able to leverage the same infrastructure out, out of, you know, if we can say it could be at a, at a cost savings, but we know that initially that won't be the case because obviously there's, this, there's that initial cost which they're constrained to uh, what they have available for the project, but at a later time, maybe for an, uh, a much bigger solution of the overall uh, company could be introduced. So Rollins, I'm just curious here, what was the rationale for the blade placement in this chassis design? And if you had it your way, how would you modify or improve on the design? Well, in this particular scenario here, a, a couple of things were experienced with the blade, uh, to the design of the blade placements. One is the fact that the customer believed in a different management structure uh, in a way that the different execution zones were to be managed by a separate team. When I say execution zone, normally it's in a context, a type of environment, production, non-production VDI, which is what we have here. So there's a dedicated production team for support. There's a non-prod team that supports that, and there's a VDI team that supports that. We could not come to an agreement on how to uh, correct that scenario in, in a, into a more efficient manner. So in this case, what ended up happening is that the blades were configured, number one, we didn't have a requirement for blade failover capacity because of the amount of hardware available, cost, and all of that. Uh, so we were then, I was forced to so basically design the cluster in the, in, within the chassis, within the blades, and place a maximum of eight nodes per chassis per execution zone. As you see in the, design, in the diagram, there are, four, there are eight blades of the same type on three different uh, chassis when, while one of them sits empty idle in the event of a failure. This is their idea of failure, of fault recovery. So if any one of these chassis would fail, um, basically take the blades out and place them down there. That's what's just empty. Now, there is a more efficient way to actually uh, uh, design this solution. One that does not increase the cost. Uh, there will be some changes in the operations on how things are managed and how things are perceived in the environment because now we can more efficiently use the hardware without having an increase in cost, but also have better benefits. Now we can actually uh, you know, make better use of the hardware. Talk about virtual machine management and how you cover the entire life cycle throughout the provisioning process towards the decommissioning. 
So the decision to design the network, the virtual network infrastructure on a, on a mix sort of environment uh, was based on a couple of things. One was management. Uh, the other one uh, was uh, reducing complexity uh, on, on managing the environment. Um, so when you look at the, the type of interfaces that we place on the different switches, uh, it's, it's specific to the, uh, to the management scenario. So for example, the management network of the vSphere infrastructure will reside on a standard switch. Same also goes for vMotion. Right? So we configure these types of interfaces once and they don't have to be configured uh, as much as you would some of the other ones. For example, the, the, the totally di opposite to that is the fact that virtual machine port groups are, no, are going to reside as part of a distributed switch. So a distributed switch will allow for uh, you know, reduce the amount of complexity in terms of the configuration on the number of hosts as the environment continues to grow. Because when you make a, a, a configuration to a distributed switch, it spans multiple hosts, right? So instead of doing a, a standard switch in that sort of scenario, uh, a distributed switch makes it better for manageability. It reduces the risk on, on, on possible mistakes uh, by, by an end user, by, by a support engineer. Uh, and also, the customer was, not, was fairly new to to vSphere 4 and the new technology, and they were not entirely sold on the ability to support all of these changes at once, right? So they're very comfortable managing the standard switches, uh, and maybe not so much with the distributed switches as it was a new technology introduced in with this version of vSphere. Uh, and that led to the, uh, the mix of the two, where if there's an outage, how, could they, how can they recover the fastest? And in this case, because of their, their, their normal use of standard switches with their previous infrastructure, it was decided that they will be able to recover if a host were to fail and the management network was out, and also for a vMotion network as well, whereas the virtual machine is a lot easier to bring them up, but also, that's in the case of a failure, in the event of configuration, things would be done a lot easier and much simpler that way. So your design is interesting using HP um, 7000 with virtual connects. You have multiple switch models here, right? You're using mixed switch configuration. Um, were there any specific customer requirements or constraints that led you to its model? And what additional alternatives are there? So the considerations around life cycle for the VMs, it, 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 it's a couple of things. So obviously there's regulatory compliance depending on the customer. For this particular customer, um, there's, there, you know, patching security had to be done uh, very precisely uh, in a very time scalar manner in that case. Um, there are scenarios where where depending on your, 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 your patching, your security patching cycle can affect on how you're going to do that. How, do you, how often, where, and where do you start? For example, do you patch the, uh, the non-production environment? Right? In this case, we have to patch the non-production environment just as much as we patch the production environment. So the window for patching the non-production environment was fairly, you know, it was, it was done at any point in time as, uh, unless there was any testing going on. Uh, for the production environment, there's actually defined time within their operations procedures where you have to adhere to that and be able to kind of, you know, when exactly are these types of, of, of applications going to be patched and when they're not going to be patching that infrastructure. Uh, another way for the lifecycle management is um, when you onboard these new workloads and when you upgrade the existing workloads, what's the process for that? Um, initially, because of the size and capacity of their cluster environment, they had enough so that what was utilized for operations was that whenever a new system, a new set of VMs are going to be onboarded into the infrastructure, they bring it into what's called a stabilization zone before it's put onto the production environment or the, the place when it's going to end up living with. It's going to be the VDI infrastructure, it's going to be the non-prod or the production environment. So it's a certain process that has to be followed in order to, to kind of adhere to, to, to what's going to happen to the life cycle of the virtual machine. How did you commission it? Right? So we talked about how do we bring them onto the uh, environment, but to decommission the systems properly, there's another procedure you have to follow now. When the system is going to be shut down, how is it going to be taken out of the infrastructure, how are you going to decommission um, those VMs? There's a process where, because of data retention policies, the data has to be retained for X amount of time, for X amount of years. So therefore, that a decommissioning, part of the decommissioning process means that this, these virtual machines, the data is placed in another uh, environment where it's backed up and kept away in the event that something has uh, failed and it's required to kind of uh, restore that back to a, to a certain time. So there are different ways to kind of go about um, the life cycle of VMs, but when they're being uh, onboarded, offload, offloaded from the system, but also the patching mechanism of that has to be um, uh, considered as part of an operation process as well.